Hey guys, it's Joel, and today I'm going to do a book review of a book called Ego and Archetype by Edward Edinger. Now, Edward Edinger is a Jungian analyst. Um, for everyone who keeps <coughs> thinking that I'm saying a uh, union, I, I'm not. I'm saying Jungian, meaning following in the tradition of Carl Jung, uh, one of the early founders of psychology with Freud and Adler. And I think that for anybody who's interested in Jungian therapy, uh, this is a really good place to start. Maybe one of the best that I've found. Now, before we jump into it, I want to point out a ton of you guys who follow me or talk about uh, stuff and ask questions and emails, you are doing Jungian therapy. It's just so post-Jungian, you don't really know that. If you're doing anything that's parts-based, that's experiential, um, and especially that is parts-based, experiential and somatic, where you're not analyzing, but you're pushing somebody into an experience, like internal family systems, like voice dialogue therapy, like uh, so a lot of kind of somatic experiencing techniques use this, a lot of stuff that's sort of borrowed from yoga and mindfulness, they uh, tend to integrate Jungian ideas. So a lot of people are doing more Jungian stuff than they know. Um, one of the things that makes it difficult to get into Jung is that it requires so much context. He is expecting that you know the language of psychoanalysis, which a lot of modern professionals just don't. Um, and then even if you do know it, some of it's outdated. Things like neuroses, like we don't use that that much anymore. Um, there's a lot of terminology that is just sort of required as vocab. Um, also, he wants you to have a background in mythology and comparative religion and uh, history. It, it, well, not history, but historiography, sort of the cultural anthropology angle. And a lot of people just don't have that, you know, um, which is fine. You don't need to have it. I mean, I happened to have a comparative religion degree before, uh, you know, I got into Jung and uh, started doing therapy. But a lot of people are doing Jungian based therapies without really knowing it. And I think Edward Edinger is one of the earliest places to sort of under Edward Edinger's uh, this book, um, Ego and Archetype is like one of the best places to sort of begin exploring Jung if you hadn't, because it's not an easy read, but it is probably the clearest one out there that requires the least context. Um, now, you don't have to read this book. I try and make these reviews so that they're also sort of like cliff notes. So if you don't want to read the book, you can just like get my summary of it and maybe use that for something. Um, but the foundational idea of ego and archetype is something that's, I think, relevant to anyone who's doing somatic or emotion-focused experiential therapy. And that is that we have an ego, and the ego um, is, you know, it's only interested in objective reality. What it can see, taste, touch, it's interested in accomplishment that is material. It's interested in competition. You know what we can do it's the part of our personality that gives us a rigid self structure and helps us maintain integrity we need an ego um, when it's too rigid uh, then we resist another reality that we'll talk about in a minute but um, it, if it's overindulged it leads you to be very existential it will make you kind of like a, a Sartre or an urban Yalom and you're going to say well you know ultimately I don't mean anything you know everything is nothing, uh, we're just a bubble on a tide of empire. And the fact that we are ultimately irrelevant, that uh, we have to sort of accept our finitude or our own ultimate unimportance, you know, just lack of infinite nature, that is true from a certain perspective. Um, you know, even if you're religious or you have, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a spiritual component, um, you know, our body doesn't last forever. We all have an inflated sense of uh, our self-worth. And, you know, the things that we build ultimately kind of crumble in, in one way. Um, and then we have a separate self, which is the, he's going to call it the self or the deep self. Um, I'm going to say that these parts of therapy, these parts of self uh, correlate to some recent medical things. It's not a language that Edinger would use, but it is language that comes up more in things like brain spotting and internal family systems. And um, what, was, what was the word I'm looking for? Uh, vasovagal, you know, type uh, experiential therapies is that the prefrontal cortex is kind of our ego, you know, it's language and our control instinct and our drive to like reason and, and, and apply logic as a problem solving thing. That's the part of the front of your brain. It's the newest part of the brain. And uh, I think that what he's describing, you know, phenomenologically, what we can look at now and say medically, this comes from 
that part of the brain that's that's new that makes me different than an animal that's just sort of always acting on instinct like my cat is that has a personality and some individual parts but it's not overly logical most of what it's doing is just doing as a part of um, its instincts that it is just feeling and acting on it's not really choosing between instincts like a person can um, you can't say you know there's multiple ways to solve this problem what do I want to do in the way that somebody who has cognitive uh, cognition or language based cognition can do so <clears throat> the second part of the brain that is sort of in opposition to the ego is the subcortical brain which Edner, Edinger calls the self but that is the part of us that when we let go of our ego you know when we dissolve our ego and we're really willing to you know, maybe dissociate a little bit you know have a little bit of a psychedelic type experience or just step outside of ourselves to feel a part of something bigger than just me you know a family or a country or a spiritual community or a nation or a uh, religion or uh, you know a, 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 a tradition of psychotherapists going back through time a Jungian something bigger than me it lets me feel something that is sort of deeper and older and if you're going to treat trauma, trauma is stored subcortically, so you've got to go back into these places. But the subcortical brain that Edinger calls the self, it has a very mystical, zen-like attitude that is emotional. It's not a thinking part of the brain. It is a feeling part of the brain. And when it's overindulged, those feelings become my whole reality. You know, if you've done therapy with somebody who has a little bit of a personality disorder or something like that, then it's like their emotions just define reality. So this part of the brain is only being used to justify this one. You know, I'm only using intellect to justify emotion. And so uh, there's not an ability to kind of sit with both of these parts. So somebody with a personality disorder, you're like, well, you're saying that this person's the best person ever, but yesterday you said they were the worst. Oh, well, I just didn't understand. I just saw this thing. Yeah, but you've been coming for six months and it switches back and forth. I think maybe you're splitting. Like, maybe they're a little bit good. No, 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 you don't understand. Let, let, me, let me explain. Or you're like, you know, these facts, these things don't justify the story. I don't understand how this is even possible. Well, those aren't real anymore. This, that's not real. This is, this is what's real right now. And they're just using their intellect to justify feeling. So that self-like part of the brain is responsible for our spiritual instinct. It's kind of where that, uh, I forget the name of the brain. Whales have it too. Theirs is bigger than ours. But it's like the, the part that provides like social and kind of the mid-cortex that provides like social instinct. And uh, mammals have like a very developed like social part of the brain. Um, you know, a lot of that stuff is what you get in what Edinger's calling, you know, the self or the the, the deep self, um, because there's this sort of spiritual component that's like everything could be one. You know, well, I can just dissolve my consciousness and be part of the whole universe. I am the center of the world, but also the whole world. And that is, you know, directly in opposition to this thing that says, no, nothing is real. If I can't see it, touch it, taste it, emotion is not real. Um, you know, only thought and logic and intellect and accomplishment and these material things are what is true. And then this part of the brain is like, no, whatever I'm feeling, that's just true right now. And I don't care if you're trying to get something done. I'm going to be re-experiencing uh, this thing that your mom said that when you were eight. And, and, you know, maybe your therapist is pointing it out, but the ego is trying not to see it. And that uh, this is kind of the revolutionary idea that's the center of the book, is that these parts of the brain, or these parts of our self, do not want to be in the same head. And a lot of therapy... Um, you know, I talk a lot about how the shadow is always paradox, the things that we're out of touch with is always paradox, and that it's not that this part's bad, this part's good, it's that they're too separate, we're pulling them together, that a lot of therapy is teaching the ego and the self to coexist. Um, so, you know, if you find yourself working with, like, addiction, if you find yourself working with somebody who's, who, you know, therapy's turning into a debate club and they're being like, no, 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 this is true, this is true, this is true, you know, this is a really cool window in because you can start to say like, yes, it is true, but it isn't all of you, you know. There's also this other truth that can exist at the same time. Sort of that DBT idea that there can be two coexisting truths. You know, Tammy can think that I'm a bitch and I can think that I'm not a bitch and I don't have to fight Tammy or I don't have to debate her and make her understand me. I can just let that be her truth. This one could be mine. We can also do that in a parts-based way in our own head, which is, you know, a, a neat idea. Um, you know, you get some of that in internal family systems, too. They, he, uh, Schwartz takes a lot of Edinger's language about the self, and the later Jungians like Moore's language about the self. I'm not guessing that he says that, so he does. Um, if A lot of people will say, IFS isn't Jungian because, because, because. Don't leave that comment. You can read what he wrote. Uh, it's based on Gestalt. It's based on Pearls. It's based on Jung. 
yeah, Schwartz tells you that. You don't have to take my word for it. Um, so th that's a cool idea. Um, and then with that premise, the book goes a couple other places. Not all of them are things that you're going to be into. Not all of them are things that you're going to apply in therapy. But the central premise is pretty cool. Um, so one of the things that he does is he goes back through the development of the self t through ages and of ch ages of people, you know, as you're aging, and then also the development of the ego. And says so like, this is what it looks like as a child, you know, whatever. And so <laughs> there's, a, you know, Jungians like mythology a lot. And so one of the things that he does is says, here's a drawing from over 100 children when they're drawing themselves from the time that they're one years old to the time that they're seven. And so the first thing that every child will draw when they're drawing themselves is not a leg or a spike or a star or eyes or a face. It's a circle. All of those drawings are different kinds of, you know, ovally circles, and you see this chart. And then slowly as they get to be one month old or two months old or three months old or two years old, three years old, they start to add different details to it. And so generally what happens is that circle gets bifurcated with a cross. So you've got this thing that's like four parts. So he takes that image and goes through mythology and says, you know, when people are in these meditative states, when people are in a very spiritual place, because children are not born with an ego, right? Like a baby has a totally just dissolved ego and it's always experiencing itself as the universe. You know, it just cries out and then my mother gives me this food, but my mother is part of me. And also, you know, like I am part of the food. I just say it doesn't have an ego yet that says that it is separate from everything else. Um, there's uh, and we start to individuate from our mom and realize that we are a separate creature from our caregiver as we get older we start to realize like I'm actually a separate thing and that process is called hatching uh, in early psychoanalytic language now we would call it in Jungian language like individuation um, but you're starting to build an ego and say like and that's why two to three years old is kind of hard because kids are like oh my gosh, I'm God, I'm totally separate, I can do anything that I want. And you're like, stop, stop, stop. And they're like running into traffic or, or drinking the bleach. And then all of a sudden when you're like, hey, no, you can do it, go play with your friend on the swing set. They're like, oh no, I want to reconnect with you. I can't be separate. And they like grab onto the mom's leg and hold on there and don't let go for a long time. You know, that's kind of a rocky process. Uh, <clears throat> but when you're building that ego integrity as a kid, you're conceiving of it as a circle, and that's just the self, and then the ego comes in later and says, no, but you are different because you have arms, and you have legs, and later on you have brown hair and blue eyes, and you know children start to add these details, but in the beginning, it's just a circle, that's what I am, and then the circle kind of becomes bifurcated with a cross. And so he says, you know, that circle and cross shape are like in almost every religious system, you know, uh, you know the Christians, of course, have a cross, but there's, you know, the mandala uh, in a lot of Asian traditions is, you know, some kind of circle that's bifurcated with a cross. Later, there's a square. And um, so that, you know, that may or may not be interesting to you. That's one of the things that he does in the beginning of the book. Um, he talks a little bit about how that influences architecture, how that influences like temple and church designs uh, throughout history. And then at the very end of the book, he goes into how the ego and the self influence like this old alchemy tradition from the Middle Ages of that people are kind of projecting their psychology onto science. That's the least interesting part to me. You have my permission to skip the last chapter. I've also just heard that a whole lot. Like for some reason, Jungians like to write about alchemy a ton because Jung did, and that's the part of Jung that like nobody got. It's where he lost like all of his colleagues. Um, I mean, I do think there's a good chance that uh, <coughs> psychology informed, you know, scientific projection onto pre-scientific, you know, attempts at science. Uh, and, and, you know, al alchemical like manuscripts and things. I just don't particularly care. Uh, it's kind of interesting, but it's not something that I want to spend a ton of time with. Uh, so, you know, not every single part of this book is something that you like, but I you might like, but I think the central premise is something that's pretty cool. And the idea that you can take people and say like, yeah, you see that from this perspective, you don't mean anything, but from this perspective, who you are is spiritual and special and good and there's nobody like you you have your unique thumbprint you're the only one that can have this conversation with me from your perspective you're the only person you know there is an inherent divinity uh, or connection with divinity uh, that you have as a person and then over here yes but at the same time you know you don't really mean anything so ego is talking you know Edinger is talking about ego inflation that growth is this process of uh, our ego thinking that it is all of us that becoming unsustainable and then the ego kind of cracking open and then the self filling it back up with some more information as uh, about who we are and what the divine is as we grow over our lifetime
as people, and that that happens at all these different ages. You know, Sidra and Hal Stone are making a lot of hay with that when they write the voice dialogue book, and they're talking about what the phases of emotional and intellectual development go on when we develop our inner critic, when we potty train it too, and when we start to develop our pusher self that's obsessive and just wants us to go and move in middle school. You know, like that that is sort of the process Edinger's describing. And then in IFS, when you're looking at where did these parts come from, this is what I identified as, and then that didn't work anymore, so I had to build this new part. And you're kind of having people re-experience, not analyze in IFS, but just re-experience that history. There's a lot of this in there, too. I mean, this is foundational for what Schwartz is doing there. Um, and then, of course, if you're doing psychoanalysis, a lot of this is relevant, but I don't know how many people are still doing psychoanalysis anymore. There's a, a lot of them in New York, but I don't know if it's active anywhere else. So <clears throat> I like Jung a lot, uh, but I think that most of the things that he does are just not accessible um, without so, so, so much context. Um, things like the Red Book ugh, that Jung writes at the end of his career. Uh, you know, it looks like a wizard's like manual. It's a spell book. It's cool. It's his you know private journal he's working on, uh, and it has a lot of great insight. But it's just not an accessible book. Something like Edinger is probably the most accessible way that I know to start to get into Jungian concepts and learn some of these things. Um, there's a few things uh, that I, I think are important to, to remember here, um, like Jung. <clears throat> Edinger is writing at a time before all of these other psychological traditions exist, and those traditions sort of exist to make these analytical concepts easier to manualize, teach, and apply. You know, something like IFS or voice dialogue or even Gestalt therapy, like, it isn't manualizable in the way that, like, solution-focused brief treatment or cognitive behavioral therapy or, like, DBT is. Like, it's pretty, you know, unique to the individual, but it's still a modality that is manualized, right? And this stuff is not manualized at all, but it's those modalities that a lot of you guys are using that are kind of coming back, the somatic and experiential stuff, those are attempts to make this stuff more accessible. And it's somebody saying, hey, this is my process for applying it, but they're still based on these concepts. And these guys are kind of the fathers of the profession, and this, there's a history to this thought. I think it's important to know, I mean, I'm more interested in the history of the profession than most people, but I think it's important to know, you know, what those are. Um, Edinger sees the way that people work as, you know, ego integrity and, sub and that self. And, and when is it that they're too close together? When is the ego inflated? Um, that's his system for trying to take Jung's work and then apply it analytically in a way that people can understand. And so he would say, okay, when the ego just totally dissolves and the self is all there is and we just feel all the archetypes from our evolutionary heritage and all of our spiritual tradition and emotional reality just become true, that's psychosis, that's schizophrenia. That's where somebody has lost any ability to differentiate between what's real and what's not, any ability to apply logic, and instead they are just feeling God, they are just feeling the universe, they are just feeling their spiritual function take over. Now he would say that if somebody is, you know, a, a rugged existentialist, that's like there is nothing other than what is felt. It doesn't matter what happened to me when I was in second grade. I nothing. I'm not feeling any emotions right now. What do you mean I sound angry? I'm not feeling any emotions. This is just what I am. I'm I'm cold and calculating and logical and intellectual, and you are not. And so I'm superior to you. And life is a hierarchy. That person has this kind of ego inflation and entrenchment that is cutting off the self that wants them to kind of grow and feel and heal and create and, you know, understand vulnerability. You know, that's how Edinger would conceptualize it, that there's these two spheres, the ego and the self, and that they're always in a process of being in relationship with one another, in proximity and also in size. You know, when we start to feel like, uh, when we get carried away, maybe you do a lot of a stimulant, you know, or you have a bipolar episode where you become manic, or you just sort of get on a high because you just, you know, you hit lucky sevens in Vegas, and then you met this girl who really likes you, and then you got a promotion, and all of a sudden you're just feeling like, I'm great. He would call that ego inflation, you know, that the self isn't really being absorbed by the ego, but the ego is starting to decide, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm God, I can do anything that I want. I can start a restaurant and I'll make a million dollars. I can do whatever, you know, somebody who's on cocaine or somebody who is uh, having a bipolar ma manic episode, that's kind of how they feel. Um, 
And but everybody does these things. You know, those are extreme examples of a chemical kind of influencing cognition. But we all go through this process of ego inflation and deflation. And Edinger's language there may not be yours, but I think it's worth knowing, uh, and I think it's helpful. So. Hopefully that's interesting to you if you want to check out Ego and Archetype. Uh, unfortunately, there's not an audiobook of this book. I like to review books where there's an audiobook. Um, but even if you don't want to read it and, and spend the time with it, uh, maybe that gives you some interesting ideas about the history of the profession that you can bring in to understand the foundations of uh, some of the modalities that we use. And I appreciate it. If you got a question, leave a comment. And uh, I uh, look forward to hearing from you. Uh, check out my website, gettherapybirmingham.com. There's a lot more videos like this. There's a podcast. There's also a ton of free resources that you can print off and use either as a patient or as a therapist to give to your patients. Um, that Again, that's gettherapybirmingham.com. Thank you so much.